Hey there everyone! We're back for another episode of Mavis and Me. Today I'm going to be discussing different forms of control that we can use when working our service dogs. the different options I really struggled trying to figure out what order to put them in. I didn't want people to think that I was rating them from kindest to harshest or least effective to most effective. I have used every one of these options with different dogs over the years. My selection always has more to do with the individual dog's personality and trainability than it does with any other factor. With a service dog we want obedience and reliability but not at the expense of engagement in making independent decisions. We can't have a dog that is dragging us down the street on a flat collar, but we also don't want a dog that's afraid to alert you because he's overly sensitive to a prong collar or an electric collar. I'm going to start with a flat buckle collar. Mavis wears one of these 24-7. This is the collar that holds her ID tags and the one that I use to safety clip her when she's riding in the truck's passenger side floor. This is also the collar that I use to clip her to her bed when I need her safely out of the way in our small house. It has a nice sturdy D-ring for her tags, which I like. The one thing that I don't like about it is the buckle is one of those plastic squeeze snap sorts. Right here. I've had these fail dozens of times over the years. If this collar was being used to seriously hold her, I would switch to a metal buckle type, as those are much stronger. I had a metal buckle flat collar on a previous service dog in training, and thank goodness I did. It literally saved her life when she decided to jump into the Grand Canyon. She was about a 100 pound Mastiff pup, around nine months old, and we'd been working on pos uh, positional commands like up, load up, off, under, over. So we stopped at the Grand Canyon after a long day of driving in the hot truck, and when I threw open my door, I yelled to my kids, look over there. And I guess all she heard was over, so she sailed over the rock wall and into the abyss. Luckily, I had a tight hold on her leash, and her flat collar was snug enough not to slip over her large head. With the help of my husband, we hauled her back over the wall to safety. <sighs> Tragedy avoided, and lesson learned. As much as I don't trust a plastic squeeze snap, it benefits come with its ease of taking it on and off. It also doesn't make a clank sound every time the dog puts her head down on the floor. I'm sure there are plenty of service dog folks who use only a flat collar with their dogs. I'm just not one of them. In my opinion, it doesn't offer enough control, and it's easy for most dogs to reinforce pulling on the leash. I feel it's a must-have if you find yourself in need of tethering your dog, because it is a relatively safe option. The next logical step in my list of equipment would be to use, utilize a martingale collar. This collar is a flat strap of nylon or leather with two O-rings on either side. Looped through these O-rings is another strap. This is the one you place your leash on. And in this case, this one's chain. Sometimes they can also be more nylon or more leather. The benefits to using a martingale collar are that they're very easy to put on and take off for folks with wonky hands like me. I have Raynaud syndrome, so my fingers have a tendency to lose circulation and go numb when I'm cold or stressed. By fitting a martingale collar to your dog's neck, it becomes a simple matter of sliding it on and off when needed. Another huge perk is that this collar is great for dogs who tend to want to back out of their flat collars. Because there's a bit of a cinching action when the leash is pulled, it tightens around the dog's neck, making it difficult to back out of. This is a great option for dogs who need to stay attached to their owners. It is safe, and it offers slightly more control than a regular flat collar. The choke chain, or slip lead, is probably one of the most common and potentially dangerous pieces of dog equipment out there. First, let's talk about how to put one on. Yes, there is a right way and a wrong way. By feeding the chain through one of the links, like this, sorry, my fingers are numb, you create what is called a live ring and a dead ring. The live ring is the one which you hooked to your leash. You want the live ring to come over the dog's neck, not up from under the dog's neck. So depending on which side your service dog walks on, you will have to make sure that you get it on correctly. When placed properly, the choke chain falls slack when you release the tension. See how it lets it loose? When placed improperly, 
the live ring will drape down from the dead ring, leaving the choke collar tight instead of releasing it the way it's supposed to. This device can offer excellent control, especially if kept high on the neck near the dog's jaw. However, if used incorrectly, it has the potential to damage the dog's trachea. When tightened, the chain puts a tremendous amount of pressure into a very small surface area on the dog's throat. Because of this, the choke chain is effective on most dogs as a correcting device. A quick on the leash will get the attention of the majority of dogs. Ideally, a choke chain's magic comes through the sound of the chain clicking through the dead ring of the collar. A well-trained dog will hear this simple noise and back off pressure on the leash. If you find yourself yanking your dog often with a choke chain, please find a better option that, or enlist the help of a trainer. The last thing you want to do is injure your service dog. Harnesses. I'm going to start out telling you that I am not a big fan of harnesses. There are very few dogs out there that are trained well enough to be walked in a harness. A normal rear pull harness where the D-ring is up by the dog's withers is an invitation for the dog to test his weight pulling or mushing abilities. Now a well-trained dog who is controlled primarily by voice commands is a perfect candidate for a rear pull harness. A handler who needs mobility assistance with either walking or pulling a wheelchair might find a rear pull harness to be an important piece of their dog's equipment. And a dog who is trained to wear one without taking advantage of it can benefit by having the pressure of pulling distributed over a larger surface area. The harness is the safest method of tethering your dog for short periods if need be because it's very unlikely that your dog will injure his neck or potentially choke himself. In my experiences, the newer front pull harnesses were simply made for people who don't want to train their dog to walk politely, but can't control them either. I've seen more dogs twisted around with their front legs pulled up off the ground, dragging their owners down the street on their rear legs. It's ridiculous at best. Many service dog handlers choose to use what's called a halty head collar or head halter to work with their dog. Halties are not muzzles. They are in no way do they inhibit the dog from opening her mouth for activities such as eating, drinking, or panting. The concept behind the halty is that most animals will follow their heads. It works on much larger horses, cattle, sheep, and goats, so why not dogs? I think the halty is an excellent tool for communicating with your service dog. By controlling her head, you control many situations that you will encounter in public. You can not only use the command, leave it, to get your dog's attention, but you can use the halty to literally bring her head around to face you. This works great when you encounter another dog, obnoxious children, or people who are trying to get your dog's attention. Not all dogs will accept wearing a halty. I used a halty on one of my service dogs for six months, and she never stopped trying to rub it off on my leg. One very important thing to remember when using a halty is to be careful never to yank your dog's head, as you can cause a neck injury. Halties are for gently guiding your dog around. They're not for discipline. My personal favorite piece of equipment is the prong or pinch collar. Here's another device that comes with a whole lot of negative baggage. Because it looks oddly brutal, people assume that it is. As far as safety is concerned, here's a collar that spreads out the pressure like a flat collar would, but it's still got enough contact to be able to communicate easily to your dog. Just the flick of a wrist or a simple wiggle of my fingers one way or another allows me to tell my dog where we're going. Most people don't fit a prong collar correctly. You want this collar snug and at the base of the skull, like this. Maybe. Good girl, stay. You can remove or add links to get the proper fit. It should not be loose and sloppy resting down here at the base of the neck. And larger isn't necessarily better. Ideally, you are using this collar to communicate with your dog and not to discipline her. The public doesn't like to see a service dog wearing a prince collar. If you find people harassing you about your prong collar, you can purchase what is called a keeper collar, which is a prong collar hidden inside of a flat collar exterior. This is how a pinch collar should be worn. Nice and loose. It's not even in my hand, it's hanging from my waist. When I need to tell her something in a busy, busy building or somewhere where it's loud and she can't hear my voice commands, I can give it just the slightest bit of touch. You can see she slows down just with little, little, little pulls. And if I pull it this way, 
She gives her the pressure. I'm not yanking on it or hurting her. Good girl. She's like, where are we going? We're going the other way. I want to go the other direction. I pull this way. Okay. And then we can go this again. Pinch collar should be tight. Shouldn't be yanking on it. The dog should be pulling into it constantly. It's just a way to communicate with your dog. The last item I will discuss is the static or e-collar, the electric collar. In the hands of an experienced trainer, this collar is a most excellent tool for communication. By delivering incremental amounts of what should amount to no more than a static shock, the dog is given information about what the trainer wants. Often this tool works well to interrupt an inappropriate fixation or a behavior in most dogs. If used properly, it can help a dog stay on track with his training. However, it is best left to the professionals, as using it incorrectly can result in a confused, anxious dog, which is the complete opposite of what we want for a service dog. Generally, I try not to resort to using an e-collar in my training. I prefer to try more reward-based training methods. In my experience, not all dogs will extinguish ignored behaviors on their own, especially if they are independently reinforced. E-collars work great to disrupt a behavior that would ultimately be rewarded if one were to step out and scold the dog. For instance, a dog that is pawing at the gate to be released from the yard. If I step outside, the dog sees my presence as a good thing, regardless of the fact that I'm discouraging the behavior. The dog quickly learns that pawing at the gate will make me appear, which is one step closer to getting out of the yard. By using an e-collar from a hidden position to disrupt the behavior, the dog associates the correction with the gate and not with the owner. Other examples of when an e-collar come in handy? Getting into the trash, counter surfing, jumping on strangers, getting on forbidden furniture, and chewing on inappropriate items. For most, the equipment that I have discussed so far provides the best opportunities for controlling our service dogs. I would be remiss if I didn't mention two other options. The first is the use of a flexi lead. A flexi is a retractable leash with an easy to hold plastic handle. Managing the dog's distance from the handler comes with the push of a button. I personally feel that flexi leads are unprofessional and inappropriate for 99% of service dog handlers. However, they can be just a ticket for those with certain disabilities. Since a flexi is maintaining a constant mild pressure on the leash, using a flat collar or a harness are the safest choices. The second option would be having no physical restraint on your service dog at all. This means there would be no leash or tether connecting the handler to the dog. This option is best suited for a handler that is challenged with daily mobility struggles and has difficulty maintaining their personal items. Adding a leash can actually make life much more awkward. Also, if the dog needs to move away from the handler in order to accomplish his tasks, having it unleashed will allow it the freedom to do its job. Obviously, the service dog who has worked hands-free must be impeccably trained and bomb-proof to all sorts of stimulation. I hope you enjoyed this video about different training tools that we can use to work alongside of our service dogs. If you learned something new, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I'd love to read about your experiences using different training equipment in the comment section below. Have a great day. Bye. Don't touch that. You're so cute. You're so cute. Yes. Let's put this back on you. <laughs> Your head grew a ton. Holy smokes, baby. Holy smokes, baby girl. <laughs>